And we need to say thank you also to all of the, um, to everyone here who's been so hospitable and the kind of audiences who've been so kind of patient and generous with us. So um, I, um, I think I'm going to reflect what a couple of the other speakers have said today um, in that I'm, uh, I feel slightly embarrassed uh, to be appearing, um, particularly at this moment in the process, because um, I, I think particularly yesterday the, the, um, the speakers were very um, ambitious and engaged. They were really, you know, if I think of uh, Nabil's uh, presentation, you know, there was kind of geopolitical perspective, a kind of satellite um, overview. And in a sense, I feel um, I'm in danger of um, shrinking things down to a kind of microscopic focus on, on one, um, one grammatical uh, typographic mark. Um, and I hope that um, I'm, I feel I've been saved somewhat by following uh, Sharmini, because I think actually she's kind of opened up a set of questions that hopefully I can pick up. Um, and also, I think to echo what she uh, she echoed from Devika and from Rosalind that, that I'm very interested in that kind of idea of close reading and maybe um, if this works then hopefully at least some this this apparently pedantic uh, question of the apostrophe can open out um, onto some broader questions. Um, just as, to start with what I um, I guess what I would like to focus on is really uh, some questions that are really about writing by artists rather than writing about artists. Um, and that's something that um, Gita touched on yesterday in terms of thinking about um, the works by Rumana Hussein and Jijish uh, Kilat. And obviously Shamini has brought that uh, very much to the fore as well. Um, and my, my research in the last couple of years has very much been about that. And it's been very pragmatic because I'm teaching writing to art students um, in Oslo. And so one of the things that I've been feeling I wanted to do was to rather than um, set them kind of academic tasks, I wanted to, to kind of point them towards writing that was actually happening in the world, writing that artists had done without a kind of academic gun to their head, to try and make them think about why why they might want to write unprompted and the different modes of writing that were available to them. Um, I want to sort of approach this question though through um, actually uh, really a kind of anecdote initially um, uh, about an apostrophe. So you may or may not be able to see, because uh, it's quite small, this apostrophe on the screen, and the, the talk is called The Artist's Apostrophe. And um, there's already a kind of dilemma in this title, obviously, about where the apostrophe goes, kind of, you know, before the S or after the S. And this is already very much the dilemma which I feel I'm inhabiting. Um, the, the topic that I'm really interested in is, is this idea of this collective um, possessive uh, apostrophe, this uh, uh, kind of genitive form of the apostrophe where a claim is made that um, a certain field of practice belongs to artists. So I think there's lots of areas that we could talk about, and certainly I don't know, you know, I'd be curious to hear. I, I don't know if that's true in, in Asia as much as it is, for example, in the UK or, part, or in the America, but I, I feel that there's a, been a proliferation of these terms like artist moving image, artist writing, artist books, and so on. And I, I started to get quite interested in what, um, uh, in a very literal sense, about what kind of um, ownership was implied. What, what, did, what kind of a field were we trying to delimit when we said, for example, artist writing or artist anything. So maybe it's worth just, I'm not going to, don't worry, this isn't going to go into a total grammar lesson, but um, uh, I, did, I did go down a bit of a rabbit hole when I first started researching this, and I found a very interesting text from 1976 by this scholar called Elizabeth Sklar, and, and um, she basically wrote a history of the apostrophe. And... Um, she starts, and she, she, you know, she has, she's quite an idiosyncratic style. I mean, I'll read this paragraph. The apostrophe is the stepchild of English orthography. It is neither fish nor fowl, typographer's convenience nor true punctuation. The possessive apostrophe is a grammatical anomaly, a vestigial case marker, appropriately shaped like the human appendix, in a noun system that has otherwise dispensed with cases. Historically, the apostrophe has spent the majority of its existence on the periphery of respectability. So, in a way, you know, she sets it up in kind of a, a curious way, this idea that actually this is a kind of disreputable bit of grammar. And actually, I, things that I'd never thought about, so that actually, when she says it's not true punctuation, um, te te in technical terms, punctuation really only refers to things that modify speech, that, and so, for example, a pause or an intonation. Um, uh, so it doesn't seem to do that, but at the same time, it's not a purely typographic mark because actually you can hear it. So if I say, 
if, if in the name Thomas, if I'm talking about Thomas and Thomas's cat, you can hear the apostrophe. So again, it's a kind of impure form. And she talks about, you know, she, she has this interesting idea of the figure of the appendix, that it's like a useless organ left over from when English had a, you know, nouns that took on genitive and dative cases. Again, if you, um, if you struggled with the apostrophe in school, you'll kind of recognize this. There's actually a term for this, which is the butcher's apostrophe. And I think it's kind of got a double meaning, which is it's kind of butchering the language, but it's also what shop signs often use. Like anxious shopkeepers often use apostrophes in these strange, in these strange ways. And I, again, I want to kind of, uh, I want to make these large claims for this small mark. So I want to, I sort of turned for, for reinforcements to Adorno, who uh, Gita mentioned yesterday. I'm not going to um, talk about him in any detail, but this, the, he wrote this wonderful text called Punctuation Marks, um, which is really about this idea that, there's, that punctuation marks are um, indispensable and they're, and they're expressive, they're part of the expressive um, power of written language. And so he writes um, in this text, so attribution sounds very generous. I attribute, this is your painting, these are your boots. This is artist's writing. But actually there's always a kind of appropriation that happens in that gesture, I think. Um, there's a kind of claiming, a delimiting. So my, in a way my, my argument uh, is very simple, which is that I think every time you see that apostrophe made for the, you know, this, this collective possessive apostrophe for artists, I, I just think one should be suspicious. Because my sense is that it, it's very rare that that claim is actually being made by artists. I think it's generally a claim uh, that is made on behalf of artists by, generally by curators um, or editors, and sometimes by critics. Um, and I, I think there's a reason for that. I think there's a kind of domestication of writing that happens in that gesture. And I'll try to explain very, very briefly um, what I mean. Um, you know, for example, nobody, nobody feels the, name, the, the need to say artist painting, generally speaking, right? That's kind of a tautology. Um, it, it always sounds quite strange, I think, to say artist painting. And that's because I think painting is a, um, a discipline which effectively is, is coterminous with fine art. It only really exists. Easel painting really is, you know, it belongs to art, to the fine art. If you think about a form like writing or a form like video, these are inherently hybrid, impure forms. And in fact, the, uh, the form of writing or the form of video that we encounter in an art context is a kind of tiny subset of a much broader field of cultural practice. And I think the reason that the art world has been so excited about forms like video and writing in the last few years is precisely that sense that these are, these are forms which have an, an immediate connection. They flow out and they flow in from the culture at large. Um, but at the same time, it's extremely threatening for um, the art world to deal with these forms where, for example, the criteria by which you judge them are not internal to art. So in a simple sense, how do you judge a piece of writing by an artist? Do you judge it in relation to a sculpture, or do you think about you know, literary histories? Or, you know, and it, it's that instability which is both very exciting and very threatening. So I think this apostrophe is a kind of attempt to tame, to domesticate that threat. Um, again, I think um, this is absolutely not so, you know, again, to go back to um, Charmini's um, talk, I think there's clearly a kind of fascinating history, which Raking Leaves is a very dynamic part of, of artist books, like books where the form of the book, for example, um, you know, is as much uh, an expression of the work as the, as the written content. So it's, um, it's absolutely not that I want to denigrate um, that, uh, that kind of work or artist books at all. It's, it's simply that what seems important to me is that um, I would like my students, for example, to think of writing as something which is not a genre, um, you know, it's not a kind of aesthetic subset of art. It's, it's an immediate political tool by which, you know, in terms of we think of manifestos, someone mentioned earlier letters to the editor. You know, it's, it's, it's a, a form of um, interaction with the rest of reality. Um, I'm kind of very aware of time, so I think I'm going to, um, I'm going to kind of wrap up fairly quickly. What, what I'll do very quickly is point to um, a specific example um, which um, I've been researching um, which I think offers a kind of slightly different way to think about this concept of writing by artists. So this, this is the cover um, of the first issue of a magazine called Trax. Um, Trax was um, published in New York between 1974 and 1977. Uh, it was edited by uh, an artist, a sculptor, then and now a relatively little known called Herbert George. And as it says, it's a journal of artist writings so in a sense, it doesn't, it's not, it's very interesting. I think what immediately strikes you when you open it 
um, is it's not um, it's not in any way a kind of um, to go back to the Maria Pusco sentence. It's not trying to escape the conventional modalities of writing and invent you know these radical new forms necessarily. It's it's actually an assemblage of everything. It doesn't have shopping lists, but it has almost everything else I think you can imagine. So it's the front cover is a is a postcard by Ed Reinhardt, and the whole the first issue um, has several of his postcards. But it has everything. It has um, uh, you know, reviews, it has a play, uh, manifestos, essays, diaries. So there's really that sense about um, all of the different existing modes of writing, some of which, um, and one of the things that Herbert George was keen not to do was he was not, he was keen not to have things that were too much like works. He actually wanted this to be about writing. And he had a lovely way of talking about this title, Tracks, because he said he wanted these texts to be clues, maybe unconscious clues, to work not yet created or ideas not yet fully resolved. Tracks are like things left behind. Ideally, creations of the moment that have a reasoned clarity when seen after the fact that they did not have when they were written. And interestingly, again, to make a connection to, to Shalmini, I think the, you know, she was saying um, the raking leaves is tied to a scale in a way, that it's this kind of intimacy and that if it grew too big or too institutional, it would collapse. And that's exactly what happened with Tracks, is that Herbert felt he got to the point where he either needed to grow or die. And he had an offer for um, an, uh, North American academic institution that wanted to publish it, and he decided instead to pull the plug because he felt that actually, you know, it was precisely the space of, of kind of open-ended inquiry that was going to get lost. Um, there's a lot more that I could say about tracks, um, and I, I feel a bit guilty for not having um, talked more about that. I think there's, um, in terms of the specifics of the journal, it's you know, it's there are lots of familiar names in there. There's actually some. There's a fantastic Barbara Kruger text or several actually. Um, um, an amazing Richard Prince, but there's also fantastic stuff in translation. So one of the things he wanted to do was, you know, to make it a conduit for things that had not been translated in, into English at that point, uh, and it certainly never been published. So, you know, I think there was a kind of, again, to go back to the um, Davita's, um, Davita's um, presentation, there, there was a kind of, you know, uh, inherent internationalism, a kind of desire for uh, an exchange, when that kind of exchange was a little bit harder to do. Um, I think I'm going to I'm going to end on a very open note, which is that I I've been I've been thinking very speculatively about um, how far I could push this idea of the apostrophe to you know how far I could um, take it to a ludicrous extreme and whether there's any way to sort of redeem it. And I started to think about this. There's a second sense to the word apostrophe, which comes from the same Greek roots, uh, which means to turn away. Um, and but it's a completely different meaning. And those of you who studied literature may know this, this term, apostrophe, which means um, it's a moment in a poem or a play when a character um, speaks to somebody who is not present or somebody who's dead or to an inanimate object. Um, so, you know, oh, death, where is thy sting? Or um, Juliet, in Romeo and Juliet, speaking to her dagger. Or these, it's always quite, you know, it's quite an embarrassing form. But I think it's kind of a very, you know, there's something very interesting about it as an idea about what does it mean why do we you know why would you why do you need to speak to someone who can't respond or can't listen and actually I you know maybe just to tie this back to the previous speakers I, I was thinking yesterday a lot about um, what Gita said about the Gandhi's letter to Hitler and you know the absurdity of this letter in a way and I think there's actually another way to read it though because I think on the, on the one hand there's and I think she was pointing to this there feels like a kind of um, a, a kind of mortifying naivety about that letter. But on the other hand, I think there's a sense, you know, and I read it again last night, I kind of looked it up, that actually a letter is a kind of apostrophe. A letter is, especially if a letter is made public, you know, a letter is maybe not for the person that it, or the, the, the absent person is addressed to. It's for this third party, this audience. And in a sense, when you read that letter, when you get to the end of it, he's got this very strange bit where he says he's not going to bother to writing to Mussolini because, you know, Hitler can sort of pass the message on. And you, you know, you end up, you've got this very strange image that somehow Hitler's going to, you know, scratch his head about this letter, and then next time he sees Mussolini, he's going to. But you know, it feels, it feels like it's not really. This is not really intended for them. This is really about us. You know, it's about. It's a kind of what. It's a bit like again, whether we like it or not. It's a kind of almost like a Yoko Ono. Um, uh, you know, war is over if you want it. It's a kind of. Um, it might be naive, or it might actually be very knowing. It might be a kind of a call to act. So I was kind of wondering if there's a way that we could reclaim a different sense of apostrophe to think, to rethink about what artist writing might do. But I, I'm not there yet, so I'm going to wrap it up. Um. Which I think uh, I already tried to open up before.
but I think it might be interesting for the conversation with everyone, which is about the fact that truck became a sort of uh, way of retraction. So, and it, it was very interesting for me in relation to Charmini to uh, this space between the architecture of the exhibition and the space of the, of the magazine and of the book. And so all those uh, artists which were invited to write, in reality, they didn't consider um, uh, writing as an art form, but more as a form of, re of retraction from something else, which was the exhibition space. And the other question is very different, but it relates more to uh, the apostrophe in itself and the apostrophe as a form of, of, of contraction. Um, and in that sense, um, uh, forms of uh, apostrophe used uh, as, a uh, as a contraction, which leads to the fact that those forms are rarely used in the written form, and therefore they open up uh, this uh, very uh, different distinction between the orality and the written language, and therefore its relation to form. So, yeah. I hope, yeah, okay, yeah, we can. Um, there's something unresolved in tracks about that relationship between texts and text as works. But I think you're right, and we talked about this in another context, that um, that maybe sometimes the choice to write text was a choice, uh, a deliberate withdrawal from the gallery space and from the white cube. And it immediately makes me think, it wasn't in tracks, but um, it makes me think actually of something that was exhibited in the gallery space, which was Adrian Piper, who's a, an, a writer and artist, who I'm sure many of you know, who I think is an extraordinary writer. And she, for a period, exhibited a series of works um, that were simply texts on the wall that said, the work intended to be shown here has been withdrawn for the um, under continuing um, conditions of racism, sexism, and so on. And in a way, what was interesting was clearly, you know, there was an immediate question about was there ever a work that had been displaced, you know, or was the work itself this act of displacement? Um, so I think there's definitely a connection there. And actually something that I meant to say was that, you know, again, I think in relation to Shamini and this idea of, of, um, of location, is that I think one of the things that writing, and again, I think there's a parallel with video, the reason that they're powerful forms is to do with distribution. And this idea of distribution, I think, is, is like a crucial idea in contemporary art in general. I think it's the kind of, uh, it's the great unspoken. And I think, I think it's, I don't think we've got time to go into detail, but that idea about distribution circulation and the way in which um, books, for example, circulate um, or video circulate is very challenging for the existing economic and cultural distribution mechanisms in contemporary art. I mean, just, qu just quickly about the idea of apostrophe as contraction. So obviously there's the second use of the apostrophe when, when you're just leaving out letters. I think that's absolutely true, and I think, there's, uh, um, I think there's ways that you could loop back into thinking that, uh, certainly in relation to what Adorno says about the relationship between um, orthography and um, typography and, and speech. Um, but I think I was particularly interested, because I think, I think really the confusion the interesting ambiguity around the apostrophe, at least, uh, you know, my sense of it is, is around this possessive form. That's where things go wrong. I think people generally, you know, and, and it's, I think that's both. So I hadn't really, I haven't really explored that, you know, the contraction of the idea so much. But I think that's true. I think that you could, they, you could push that further. Well, maybe you can just follow up uh, because I think it, that there is a very important detail in track, in tracks about funding and uh, circulation, to its distribution, because there was no. If you can say something more about it, I think. It's for yeah, I mean, um, so I've been uh, working with Herbert George, the original editor, because we're going to publish an anthology um, of a selection of from tracks uh, in the next few months, hopefully. Um, and Herbert came to Oslo, and we talked a lot about the history. I interviewed him about the history of the magazine. And yeah, it was, um, again, I think this goes back to um, uh, Davika's talk, but it was basically kind of, he had some collectors that he knew, and they effectively funded it enough that it meant he didn't have to get advertising. And for him, he couldn't um, stomach the idea of advertising. And I think he was, he's a very, um, and still is, uh, you know, an extremely uh, idealistic artist. And he really, um, uh, he's ex very, very excited about art, and he's uh, kind of horrified about um, its commercialization. And he, you know, to, to a kind of, again, to go back to the question of naivety, I think he, you know, he exhibits in a way quite an extreme position in that. And I, that's, in a way, very, uh, exciting to talk to him about. So uh, yeah, in terms of his funding, it was it was very modest. It was done with a private benefactor, and as soon as he had to try and find more funds, he decided it wasn't worth it. It wasn't worth compromising. Thank you. 
I mean, I'm very interested in them. I'm, I'm particularly interested in the, the kind of peculiar British history of this mass observation, for example, and that, that kind of moment when they would turn back onto the British populace. Um, but absolutely, I can definitely see, you know, I, I think that would be really exciting. I think, I think for me, the main thing is, is that, um, again, in teaching, it feels important to me that artists have a sense that they, um, there's two sides to it. So the eth that kind of ethnographic work um, might be about uh, research and feed into the content of work, and it might be an important conceptual tool for doing that. But I'm also interested in, in the forms of writing, like criticism. Um, you know, again, I think um, Sharmini was saying in a way that the kind of um, reticence that artists might feel in relationship to being asked to, to think about art criticism. But I'm, I'm actually very interested in that way in which, you know, artists who insist on minting their own critical vocabulary rather than leaving it to the critics. So there's not this sense that the work is a be all and end all to everybody, that actually you put the work into the world at the same time as you put a set of critical tools that you think are, and you know, that, there's, there's a politics to that. I think that's, that's, to me, is the politics of it. And that's one of the things that I think artists, that's why I think artists have to write unless they want other people to ventriloquize for them, basically. Okay, artists, art, the very other No, I don't. And I'm, again, this this is one of my other embarrassments to quote with this idea that um, that each language I think has these specific. You know, that the, the grammar, the things that we think of as simply typographic or grammatical, um, yeah. are kind of indexes of you know historical social changes in language. And again, um, at the risk of overinterpretation, and in, in maybe in a slightly adorning way, I do think that in the English language, that possessive apostrophe is testifying to to something that we can tease out, maybe at the risk of overinterpreting, but, but, but again, no, I, I haven't, and that's something that I'd like to, I'd like to look into, but it is a specifically English disease, yeah. yeah. Uh, Mine is very, you know, talkative She ran a journal called Happy Hypocrite, and that's how she described the criticism, the whole entire, entire enterprise of criticality, because if you had it, criticism can be also, it should be able to make fun of itself, it's in that sense. I mean, not in her case, but in, in other, you know, maybe some kind of followers. And I think sometimes you see kind of experiments being done by artists with writing that actually look incredibly naive because they're detached from the actual histories of, of literary experimentation, for example. And that's a bit frustrating, I think. Um, but it's, in a way, it's a, you know, I'm splitting hairs. You know, I think she's 